Hey, my name is Dr. Dana Wasserman, and this is Tough Talk with Dr. Dana. Today's tough topic is somatic symptom disorder, which is surely a tough topic for many who have lived or who continue to live with it. But first, please read the disclaimer and listen carefully to these important words. I'm legally required to tell you that I'm not providing any psychological services and that this isn't intended to treat, diagnose, or cure any psychological issues you may have. I will be sure to honor your questions so that if necessary, you will know better when to seek help. So today we're going to talk about somatic symptom disorder. First, I'm going to talk about what exactly somatic symptom disorder is, say that three times fast. Then I'll review the specific symptoms of somatic symptom disorder. Next, I'll review some causes of somatic symptom disorder, basic characteristics of somatic symptom disorder, cultural factors, and lastly, I'll go over treatment. All of this within 15 to 20 minutes. Let us commence. Somatic symptom disorder is something that I discovered while I was flipping through the DSM-5 last week. I noticed that I had gone over so many of the more common mental illnesses, and I thought it'd be important to spotlight one that doesn't get as much attention. And while I describe it, you'll come to realize why I chose this one, um, particularly in light of lessening of stigmas this is a diagnosis that has changed over time, and I think in the service of reducing its stigma. So somatic symptom disorder is a mental health condition or a mental illness that seemingly joins the physical and the psychological. Indeed, the term soma means body. Therefore, we are dealing with a mental illness that has to do with the physical body. How is this so? Somatic symptom disorder involves the almost extreme focus on bodily sensations and symptoms. This focus or hyper-focus on the sensations, if you will, becomes so all-consuming as to begin to interfere with daily functioning. In other words, one with somatic symptom disorder might not be able to discern what a normal bodily sensation is and a sensation that might be pathological. Diagnostically, the focus is not so much on the bodily sensations themselves, but rather the way in which people present the nature of the sensation and how they interpret them. There is no need to shed light on the typical question, whether the bodily sensations are quote unquote real and can be medically proven. This is ultimately irrelevant. We want to look at how people feel and act in response to the sensation. This is what causes the distress and the subsequent issues. We look at thoughts, feelings, and behaviors regarding the bodily sensation. So I thought that I would go over some of the specific symptoms of, um, of somatic symptom disorder. One or more somatic symptoms that are distressing or result in significant disruption in daily life. Well, that makes sense. It's one or more bodily pains or uh, it can be a more vague uh, concern like fatigue that is distressing and that interferes in daily functioning like I had mentioned before. Next, excessive thoughts, feelings, or behaviors related to the somatic symptoms or associated health concerns as manifested by at least one of the following. So we're talking about very heavy thoughts and very consuming feelings and behaviors related to whatever somatic or bodily sensations or feelings and associated concerns about one's health that are manifested by, one, disproportionately persistent thoughts about the seriousness of one's symptoms, persistently increased level of anxiety about health or symptoms, and three, excessive time or energy devoted to these symptoms or health concerns. Now, although any or all of the somatic symptoms may not be continuously present, that means the pain or whatever is being felt may not be present, the state of being symptomatic is, that is the concern, the worry, the hyperfocus, that is consistently present. And these symptoms typically last more than six months. 
Now, like other diagnoses, there are specifiers as well. You can specify if the bodily sensations are predominantly pain, or you can specify if the symptoms are persistent. That is, a persistent course is characterized by severe symptoms, marked impairment, that is marked uh, interference in daily functioning, and a long duration of more than six months. And it can also be deemed mild, moderate, and severe. The symptoms may be specific, such as a localized pain, like uh, head pain or stomach pain, or it can be relatively nonspecific, which would be fatigue or overall aches and pains. Now I want to talk about possible causes or factors contributing to somatic symptom disorder. First is genetics and biological vulnerability. So once again, when we look at causes, we look at genetics and environment. We look at nature and nurture. So in terms of genetics, there uh, is a consideration of whether that some people have an increased sensitivity to pain that is inherited biologically. That is, is there a genetic path down for some people who are simply more sensitive to pain than others? Or there, and or I should say, there is an early traumatic ex experience such as violence, abuse, deprivation. This may also be a factor contributing to somatic symptom disorder. Then, then there is also learning. For example, the consequences of attention obtained by illness. That is, there may have been a particular focus of attention on illness that grew over time. In addition, there may have been a lack of reinforcement over distress expressed in ways other than through the body. For example, if distress were ignored when expressed verbally, such as, wow, I'm really sad, I'm really upset, I'm having a hard time, but nobody pays attention, and then attention is paid to when expressed physically, oh, ouch, I'm in so much pain here, oh, what can I do for you? Then that person may be more likely not necessarily all the time, but more likely all over time to express him or herself through physical, yes, somatic means. I wanna talk about a few facts about somatic symptom disorder that I found interesting. People with somatic symptom disorder are more likely to show up at medical clinics rather than mental health clinics because the focus is again on the body. And this is why uh, when I did a little research, they don't really have statistics on the prevalence of somatic symptom disorder because most people don't show up to mental health clinics. They show up to medical clinics because it is believed, of course, understandably, that this is a physiological issue. And going to medical doctors typically does not allay one's fears and concerns, and some interventions may actually worsen one's symptoms particularly if there are adverse effects to the intervention. So if one has um, a particular pain and there is a treatment, and that treatment itself may have some bad side effects, well, that might actually heighten the anxiety and focus on that pain and be even more debilitating to that person. I really like this quote about how this diagnosis has changed over time. Quote, somatic symptoms without an evident medical explanation are not sufficient to make a diagnosis. The suffering is authentic, whether or not it is medically explained. And that's not what has happened in the past. Typically in the past, I'm talking about the DSM-4, that is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the really, really big book from which we clinicians diagnose. Um, there was more of a focus of whether or not these pains were quote unquote real. We're not looking at that anymore. Now we're looking at the suffering is authentic, whether or not there is medical evidence to the proclamation that I am in pain. We take that as it is, as it should be. So before this diagnosis appeared in the DSM-5, again, that's the newest edition of the Diagnostics and Statistical Manual. Um, this uh, was once termed um, somatoform disorder, and quote, the previous criteria overemphasized the, the centrality of the medically unexplained symptoms, 
end quote. So we see a real change in culture here, I think, just from that alone. And that there is no more stigma placed on the person who is presenting to all these doctors saying, I have pain, I have pain, and yet all of the tests are showing that there is nothing physiologically pathological going on. But yet there is still something, and still something that should be taken seriously and not stigmatized, and that should be treated. And it's interesting, too, that somatic symptom disorder can include medically explained symptoms as it's the psychological response to said symptoms that constitute the disorder. Another aspect of somatic symptom disorder is that people with somatic symptom disorder have very high levels of worry and distress about illness in general. Physical symptoms are experienced as a major threat, potentially harmful, and often people with somatic symptom disorder think the worst about their health. They will fear the seriousness of their symptoms and ruminate on the worst case scenario. In severe, remember I said there were specifiers before, mild, moderate, and severe. In severe somatic symptom disorder, concerns of one's health may take over one's life, forging an identity unto itself and dominating all interpersonal relationships. The quality of life regarding one's health is often impaired, both physically and mentally. In other words, for some with somatic symptom disorder, their world revolves around their responses and their feelings and their thoughts and behaviors around their physical symptoms. I want to look at cognitive factors and behavioral features of somatic symptom disorder to also begin to, to flesh out what it is like to live with this particular mental illness. For cognitive factors, we look at attention and that there is an attribution of normal bodily sensations to physical illness, and that there is the possibility of catastrophic interpretation, a worst case scenario. That is a kind of, let's say that I have itches, and maybe I was bitten by a bug, but for someone with somatic symptom disorder, that, that might be catastrophic. That might be an infection that travels through the bloodstream caused by the bug bite or something like that therein. Thoughts that is cognition, revolve around persistent worry about the illness. So there's just a constant stream of thoughts about worry about the illness that really doesn't stop and can be very debilitating. And that there's a fear that any physical activity can damage the body. Typical behavioral features you'll see in somatic symptom disorder are repeated body checking for problems. And I don't mean just little checks. I mean a constant, uh, persistent checking the body for anything that seems relatively amiss. Repeated seeking of medical help and reassurance. And this is uh, regarding people who go to doctor after doctor after doctor, trying to find out what's wrong and not getting the answers they want. Because typically what happens is that the medical tests aren't showing anything. And that leaves both the doctor, the medical doctor, and the client very, very frustrated. It leaves the client frustrated because there's no cause for these pains or for this fatigue or what have you. And it's very frustrating for the doctor, I would think, because I would wonder if the medical doctor is fearing that, you know what, I don't want to miss anything. And am I missing something, regardless of all the tests that I'm giving? Avoidance of physical activity is also very typical for the reasons I explained above, that any fear, uh, the fear that physical activity could further damage the body, and that they typically present to medical services and not mental health services. So they may not be as likely um, to catch this illness as it is, uh, you know, it can masquerade as more a physiological disorder. And this, even though it's, it's a seemingly new disorder, it really doesn't have new origins. In fact, going back to the early 20th century, even Freud uh, had interest in this. And I wanted to read you a quote about Freud regarding you know, the somatization of physical symptoms. And I read you, quote, Freud believed that somatic symptoms were the expression of a defense mechanism and that somatic symptoms were a way to ease inner conflict. Somatic symptoms can be viewed as the emotion itself, specifically an unpleasant subjective experience, 
mainly related to anxiety and depression. What makes Freud's comments so prescient is that anxiety and depression are highly comorbid with somatic symptom disorder. That means they are commonly co-diagnosed with somatic symptom disorder. And that, at least in this quote, Freud focuses on the emotional response to the physical somatic symptoms rather than to the somatic symptoms themselves. Um, I wanted to take a step to the left here and talk about the difference between somatic symptom disorder and what was originally called hypochondriasis, uh, which is being a hypochondriac, you might have heard that. That's now called illness anxiety disorder. And the reason why I talk about that is I think that the word hypochondriac is a very loaded term. It has been used rather pejoratively or and it's rather stigmatized. Um, how many times have you heard in the media in some kind of movie, you know, oi, would you stop? being a hypochondriac or something akin to that. And I think that's very problematic because illness anxiety is a real problem and a real disorder. And they're not the same. Somatic symptom disorder and illness anxiety disorder is not the same. And let me discern the difference because it is rather minute. Somatic symptom disorder is diagnosed when so significant somatic physical symptoms are present. People with illness anxiety disorder, or what used to be called hypochondriasis, have minimal physical symptoms and are concerned with the idea, the concept, that they are typically extremely ill, not so much a focus on the symptoms themselves. So let's talk about cultural issues around somatic symptom disorder. You know, symptoms can vary by culture, and it is imperative that cultural factors be taken into account when working with someone with possible somatic symptom disorder. Notably, and this is interesting, the relationship between numerous somatic symptoms and depression seems to be similar around the world and within cultures within a single country. However, there are also differences in somatic symptoms among cultures such as the sensation of too much heat in the body, which is common in some cultures, but rare in others. What's a big somatization in Western culture? I would think the headache. We talk about headaches all the time, stress headaches, but then we can graduate from there to migraine and cluster headaches. We need to be cognizant of cultural norms that devalue or stigmatize psychological suffering as compared with physical suffering. Cultural differences in medical care affect the presentation, recognition, and management of these somatic presentations. And somatic presentations can be viewed ultimately as a view of personal suffering in a cultural and social context. So we really can't look at one's symptoms in a vacuum. We do need to look at how these symptoms are brought about culturally and socially. Next, what can loved ones do for, one, for someone diagnosed with somatic symptom disorder? Well, first, pro provide the one with somatic symptom disorder support and understanding and encourage healthy relationships with their healthcare providers, not antagonistic. Help to follow treatment plans that avoid frequent ER visits and instead encourage the person who has somatic symptom disorder to go to outpatient services with a consistent provider in order to promote stability and a sense of predictability, helping to lower the chances for anxiety to begin to manifest. And what this is saying is try to minimize any kind of uh, doctor shopping, as it were, because that can be very, very distressing. You can help track symptom information to discuss with the provider. And you can also be reassuring and help to communicate with the healthcare team because sometimes somatic symptom disorder becomes a family disorder because so much of the attention is placed on the symptoms of the person, him or herself. And lastly, we can talk about treatment. Treatment needs to be specified to the needs of each person. And it's imperative to keep cultural factors in mind that play a part in the somatic symptoms. Having a positive therapeutic alliance with the provider is absolutely crucial in treating somatic symptom disorder, as providing legitimacy and empathy go a really long way. 
Medications are also sometimes utilized, particularly if the person is dealing with comorbid depression or anxiety, which is quite common, which both are quite common with somatic symptom disorder. In terms of therapeutics, cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness-based therapy have also been deemed effective treatment options for somatic symptom disorder. And though a seemingly chronic condition, the aforesaid treatment strategies are likely to minimize distress and bring about at least a modicum, we hope, of functionality. And that's my talk for today. Let's see. Right. Not seeing any. Okay. Not seeing any comments. Okay. Hmm. hmm. All right, well, it looks like I'm not seeing any comments today. So I think we're going to end here. I wanted to thank you very much for listening to my talk on somatic symptom disorder. I hope you learned something valuable about something that is lesser known um, and not talked about as much yet, I believe is equally as important as any other mental illness. And thank you for being here. My name is Dr. Dana Wasserman, and this is Tough Talk with Dr. Dana. Thank you.